And, and while you're there at this church, you begin this, uh, you get involved in housing issues in the community, uh, acting out the kind of civic engagement that you mentioned a moment ago and these other ministers that you had seen and that your father exemplified yeah. too. That, you thought that was a part of the, the job, the task of being a minister. Well, every time I saw an example of a black minister who was really, really relevant, mm -hmm. it was not just preaching. It was not just visiting the sick. It wasn't simply baptizing <laughs> and um, those things. It was also helping the community with the basic issues, you know, good news. What's good news to the poor? A job. Mm -hmm. You know, what's good news to the homeless? An apartment, a house to live in. And so, yeah, we immediately immersed ourselves in that kind of a ministry. We became the focal point for the formation of a, a development corporation, the Union Development Corporation, that took on the city's relocation housing. The city of Montclair was doing its first urban renewal project, mm -hmm. and a bump, bunch of ministers, we got together and said, we're not going to let it be urban removal, because where they were going to put it was, of course, where? Right. In the middle of the low-income black community, and um, they didn't have a housing authority, so we said we'd like to be the housing authority, insist upon good, safe, decent housing, and uh, built a housing project there. Mm -hmm. uh, and then by 1970, you're at Princeton Theological Seminary, and you get involved in a lawsuit about housing discrimination. Tell me about that real quickly. Well, I went to Princeton along with my good friend Joe Roberts, mm -hmm. uh, who at that time was at the Elmwood Presbyterian Church. We became vast friends. A little bit later, when he became an executive with the Southern Presbyterian Church, I introduced him to Daddy King, and lo and behold, he's now the pastor of Ebenezer Baptist mm -hmm. Church. Uh, and uh, we would go down to Princeton, got my master's degree, and while a minister, and I was single at Union Baptist Church, I was looking for housing. And I went to this very fancy uh, uh, garden apartment and saw an apartment I liked and wanted to rent, and they wouldn't rent it to me. Uh, they said, no, it's no longer available. I knew immediately that that was a lie. You know, black folks understand discrimination, see it, smell it, a mile off. And I got really angry and I called someone, and I'm trying to remember who it was. I think it might have been the guy who was a city councilman and was a member of my church who later became mayor. Uh, and he called a couple people and uh, they said, Bill, are you sure? And I said, I'm absolutely sure. And they said, you know, we ought to do something about this. And so we called a friend, a uh, young Jewish lawyer, and asked his advice and he said, you know, that's outrageous. He said, uh, let me try something, I'll be right back. He and his wife went to the same apartment building immediately, asked for the apartment, was shown exactly the apartment I was shown. Mm. And they called back and said, um, you were discriminated against. And um, his name was Sam Freeman. And he said, I want to represent you. Mm. And uh, I filed a lawsuit. Uh, I didn't take it through the uh, Civil Rights Commission of the state mm -hmm. or the county. Uh, I filed a unique lawsuit. It was the first time, I believe, in history in America, anybody filed a lawsuit for damages uh, because of uh, damage done to the person, mm. psychological damage, the impact of discrimination. So I didn't file just for the apartment. I filed for money. When you discriminate, you pay the victim mm -hmm. if you're guilty. And that was a radical concept mm -hmm. at that time. And uh, we took it all the way to uh, the courts of um, New Jersey and won. And uh, the judge said, you don't look too psychologically damaged. So uh -huh. the damages were very small. But the president, it was a case called Gray versus Ceruto. Mm -hmm. And it, it basically established that if you discriminate, you are liable for cash damages. And then in 1971, you marry Andrea Daesh, um, starting a, f a family for the first time. Mm -hmm. And then the next year, you become pastor of the church your father had pastored. Um, and shortly after that, um, four years after that, you run for Congress against the man for whom you had been an intern, Congressman Nix. What, what led to that decision? Why did you challenge him? Well, uh, basically what happened was uh, after I got married and uh, I was a college professor, pastor of this very significant church, I thought I had 
achieved and gotten exactly where I wanted to be in this beautiful bedroom, Pacassandra community, Montclair, New Jersey. Uh, you know, it was the ideal life. Uh, my father died rather suddenly, mm -hmm. uh, had a heart attack and passed away. And uh, the church asked me to come back. My first answer was no. Mm -hmm. I said, you know, I really, no, I, I don't really want to be a candidate. And uh, because I figured it would be very difficult to pastor a church where everybody remembered you as a kid. I mean, there were people in that church who literally had at one time held me in their arms. But hadn't your father done that too? Yeah, and, um, but I just thought it was just too difficult, mm -hmm. you know, to go past a church where you grew up in. I mean, and um, he had been away from the church for, uh, you know, a decade or two. Uh, I really hadn't been away. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, and these people still saw me as, you know, little Billy, you know, mm -hmm. and that's what they used to call me. And um, so I had real misgivings, uh, but finally they voted twice. They had one election, then they had another. And both times they said, we want you, and I decided to come back. And uh, when I got back, the church was already involved in what I call that whole ministry. Mm -hmm. And I became involved in it. And like most black Baptist preachers or black ministers, period, whether you're AME or Baptist or whatever, you're involved in the community. You're involved in the political issues. You're involved in the social issues, whether you like it or not. People expect you to speak out. They expect you to exert leadership because historically black preachers are the independent force of leadership in the black community. They're paid by the black community. They're nurtured by the black community. And generally they're not beholden to anyone else. You can't threaten them with the loss of job. And so I got involved in doing the same thing that ministers have done throughout history in the black community. I got to talking about, you know, various issues, economic issues, political system. And at that time, there was a mayor named Frank Rizzo who ran the Philadelphia political machine. And uh, that machine was not responsive to the needs of uh, the African-American community. Uh, and uh, there were those in the community who were trying to bring about change. I allied myself with them. And uh, some time I think I was shooting off my mouth about what was wrong. And somebody said, well, why don't you do something about it? Run for public office. And I said, okay, I will. And they said, uh, run for Congress.